Welcome back, everybody. We're here today, part two of our Cabral House Calls. Thanks so much for joining. If you want to follow along with today's questions, you can head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2739. stephencabral.com slash 2739. We answer all things wellness, weight loss, weight gain, anti-aging, longevity, healthy biohacking, and so much more. Love being able to share with you my um, opinion, my second opinion to what might be ailing you. I help to try to find the underlying root cause. That's what it's all about. And then use natural health, integrative-based modalities to go about healing the body. What I can't do, what you know I can't do is provide you any medical advice, medical treatment plans, medical cures, or medical diagnosis. Uh, only a licensed medical doctor could do that. All right, so let's get into the, today's show. I'm opening up the giant Word document that my team has put together for me. They do such an amazing job each and every week. And again, if you want to follow along, today's 2739. All right, let's see. First question coming in from Monica. Monica says, hi, I'm 43, diabetic, hemoglobin A1C of 6.3, hemoglobin A1C of 6.3. How can I get rid of the situation? Every day I walk 10,000 steps, weight train two days a week, eating low carb, but failed. Please help me out. I'm from India. Thank you. Okay. Happy to help. So we know that we want our hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C to be 5.7 at the very highest or less. That's the goal. Okay. So this person is most likely type 2 diabetic, not type 1 diabetic. I don't know. Again, I'm just surmising from uh, three total sentences, you know? Uh, okay. So they're walking 10,000 steps every day, which is amazing. Just a quick tip. Try to do that after meals. Try to get your steps in after your meals. That will help with what's called your postprandial glucose spike. It won't allow your blood sugar typically to spike as high. Again, I'm not giving you any medical advice or medical treatment plans. The weight training is great two to three times a week. Amazing. Low carb, only in the beginning, because please do check out my previous podcast podcast because carbs do not cause diabetes. Processed food, yes. Hydrogenated fats and oils, yes, right? But not the whole food variety. It's just There's no evidence to that whatsoever, like at all. And I have lots of podcasts on that. So what I recommend, and um, I don't believe that we ship anything to India right now, is you have to work with a good integrative health practitioner level two or naturopathic doctor that looks at the body from a, a metabolic disorder, a hormonal disorder, and actually looks at the cell membranes. It's so important. So um, one thing you can do is read my book, The Rain Barrel Effect. It teaches you the foundational principles of diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, emotional balance, scientifically backed supplements, and a success mindset. Because remember, you can end up with high glucose because you're not sleeping enough. You can end up with high glucose because you have high levels of cortisol. You can end up with dysregulated uh, metabolism because of low thyroid. So I don't know what's causing your diabetes, but I know that you can do certain tests. They can even be done right at home. And by running those, you'll find out what is causing your uh, high blood sugar. Okay. So hopefully that's a good place to get started. Julie is up next. Hi, Stephen Cabral team. My name is Julia. I'm 35 years old. I'm a woman living and working in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. I'm kindly requesting that you respond to my message. In 2021, I was infected with and recovering from, let's just put the virus. Um, soon after this, I was diagnosed with severe GERD. For those that don't know, understand what that means, it's gas gastro, excuse me, um, basically it's acid reflux. We'll just put it that way. Esophageal. So I think there was a connection. I have had two colonoscopies and three opinions with no success. All I get is the same prescription for Nexium or Pantacid. Currently only eating boiled food, no spices in an attempt to stop the reflux and nausea. I spent all my money to get help. I'm not giving up, but I'm feeling like I'm running out of options. I'm only 35 and this disease has changed my life for the worse. I hate taking PPIs, but after a few days, it's the only form of relief. I beg you kindly, please help me. Okay, well, I will do my best to help you without a doubt. So if we think of like, let's take, um, let's take the virus out of this. We know the virus can cause inflammation and that inflammation could be then causing GERD. So what do we need to do? We need to rebalance the immune system. No doubt about that. Again, it's the whole de-stress protocol that I just explained for uh, Monica. And, and again, you can get a copy of my, the book, The Rain Barrel Effect, I believe pretty much anywhere in the world um, through Amazon and, and other outlets. So 
Okay, let's step back a little bit. What else could be causing GERD and acid reflux? I have lots of podcasts on this. Could be H. pylori. It's one of the most common causes. Have your doctors tested for Helicobacter pylori, a bacterial infection that leads to stomach ulcers and GERD. Let's check for that. The second one is a hiatal hernia. It is a uh, disformation, typically from some type of injury, to the lower basin, base of the esophagus, called the lower esophageal sphincter, which then doesn't allow the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter, to close, which then allows the little bit of stomach acid or the acid that might be in the stomach to actually come up. Okay, there's one thing. Uh, you're already probably eating like very bland food, so that's probably not it. I would really start there. I really would. And then look at overall inflammation and stress uh, to help rebalance those. That's where I would start. Okay. And I have lots of free shows as well. Free, completely free at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Use the search box, type in acid reflux. And then another search, type in GERD. Lots of shows on this, okay? Because then I can also give you at least temporarily some supplements that could help. Even things just like cabbage juice, right? That can be really, really helpful. And then you can do things like um, what's inside of uh, the healthy gut support. I know we can't get it to you in Kenya, but you can look in your area for um, glucosamine. You can look for glutamine, for aloe vera, for slippery elm, for marshmallow root. Like you might be able to find these things. Another one is, um, what's another great one? Oh, it's right at the tip of my tongue, right in the front of my uh, frontal lobe of my brain. What is the name of it? It is, oh, it's, I know it's going to come to me during the show as well. It's not slippery elm. It is DGL. DGL could be another great one as well, taken before meals. Deglycerinated licorice root. Not licorice root, but DGL, deglycerinated licorice root. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful, Julia. Appreciate you. Totally understand the struggle. I was on PPIs as well when I was 17, 18 years old. I figured out my underlying root causes. I believe you can as well. Cheryl's up next. Hello, Dr. Rawl. Do you have a diabetic meal plan protocol similar to the CBO sensitive uh, gut guide? Um, great question, Cheryl. We are not able to give out medical based meal plans, all right? But inside of IHP and fatlosity, you can get the meal plan that we recommend for healthy weight loss that can sometimes coincide with what people may want to do for type 2 diabetes, but definitely not medical advice, definitely not a medical treatment plan, but you might want to look at those. Just saying. Okay. And um, so you can go to stephencabral.com slash fatlosity. That's F-A-T-L-O-S-S-I-T-Y for more details. All right. Let's get in one or two more questions. Next one's from Jeffrey. Jeffrey says, hello, Dr. Rawl. I'm one of your IHP2 HPH students here. I recently, hey, Jeffrey, I know exactly who you are. Appreciate you writing in. I recently learned about a sometimes fatal condition called Stevens Johnson's syndrome, toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis. SJS and 10. Yes, I've heard of SGS before. Don't have a lot of, um, I don't have a lot of experience in this, but let's see what you wrote. And how those have a, with a weakened immune system are at a higher risk, especially when introduced to new medications like sulfur, uh, antibiotics, and others for seizures, gout, or mental illness. I searched your podcast to learn more and was surprised to find no results. So here to ask what you can share about the condition from a root cause and IHP perspective. Thanks. Okay. So one, it's, um, more rare. All right. So, but I always happy to like, again, if you bring it up, I'm talking about it here on the show Two, I don't have a ton of experience with this. So that's another thing, but, um, three happy to talk about it now because I do understand it. So, uh, essentially what SJS is, is a, how I understand it again, not being an expert in this, it is a toxemia inside of the body to that then essentially erupts through the skin and shows up as a skin-based condition. And that dis-ease of the body is actually fatal, I believe, in around 10% of the people. And that's a, good, that's a high number, right? That's one out of 10 people. That's a lot. Um, however, it occurs usually when given a certain medication, like Jeffrey stated, a sulfur-based antibiotic. So for me, that's essentially the the knowledge base I have of this. 
is the toxemia that's created as a reaction to medication. And the important thing, I think, is to be tested for sensitivities to these medications before one may take them. That's really my only offering here because this is a conventional medicine-based prescription and a conventional medicine-based then outcome. And that, of course, is not what I specialize in. So, Jeffrey, sorry, I did my best. Hopefully, that was helpful at least to get started. All right, let's do one more question. This one is from Darren. Darren says, good day, Dr. Cabral. Thank you for all you do. It's really appreciated. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate you being a part of this community. Two questions. Oh, two questions. Okay. When you say avoid eating fruit alongside meals, does that also apply to those that are technically fruit, but often considered a vegetable? For example, avocado, cucumber, tomatoes, peppers, uh, etc. Okay, so let's answer your questions one at a time. The answer is no. Uh, so when you eat an avocado it acts as a fat. It's essentially a monounsaturated fat, very much like olive oil, but not the same, but very much like it. Okay. When you eat tomatoes or cucumbers or peppers, uh, well, tomatoes and cucumbers are nightshades. So those are a little bit different, a little bit different. But if you don't have an issue with nightshades, then we just classify them then as a vegetable, even though they are a fruit technically. Um, same with cucumber, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about like seeded based veggies, but cucumbers, no problem at all. So I have no issues with those. All right. So Basically, if you're going to eat fruit with a meal, eat it first, and I have a podcast on food layering. Allow it to digest, move through your stomach, rather than being fermented along with proteins, etc. All right, so that's easy. And if you're doing a smoothie, it basically all bets are off. You've pre-digested your food. It makes it easy to digest. I've never seen an issue with people in smoothies. I really haven't. The only time I've ever seen an issue is when sometimes people add leafy greens to smoothies. That can give them some, some digestive upset, and so they don't eat they don't add leafy greens, just smoothies, right? So easy enough. All right. Uh, number two, question two, does one still need to supplement with, let's say, magnesium if they're consuming a lot of pumpkin and chia seeds or bananas and veggies daily? Same with vitamin C if I eat a lot of fruit. Thank you. Well, to be honest with you, it's really impossible for me to say, right? This is all based on bioindividuality. Let's say that you're someone taking a lot of calcium. Well, then you need enough magnesium to offset that. Let's say you're someone that, ha that has a lot of stress, okay? Then you need more magnesium. Let's say that you're someone who has a lot of inflammation. Uh, they're dealing with a lot of immune issues. Well, you need a lot more vitamin C. And you may not be able to get it all through food alone. So I'm not the one to say if you need more or not. If your body needs more than the whole food you are providing, then you may need a little bit more. Here's what I do. Very simple, very straightforward. Because how much you need changes on a daily basis, believe it or not. Because your body's need needs change on a daily basis. If you work out harder, you may need more natural antioxidants, right? Like if you're more stressed, you may need more, ma more magnesium that day. I eat a good quality, predominantly plant-based, whole food diet with 7 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. That's, that's what I do. My fruit is in my smoothie and my veggies are at my meals, right? Okay, keep it really simple. And then I do the daily nutritional support every single day. It gives me all my vitamins and minerals. Then I do the daily fruit and vegetable blend powder, which gives me even more fruits and veggies, 22 organic fruits, vegetables, and superfoods because it's a really wide variety. I take a daily probiotic. I take in a daily omega-3 because every day I don't eat fish and I want my omega-3s, and it's just two grams, and I use a high EPA. Okay, and then um, every day, I do balance zinc, I do vitamin D, I do vitamin C. Those are my fail-safe that I do every single day, no matter what. Now, most days, I do take magnesium at dinner. Uh, and most nights, I do take some liquid magnesium, like there's a liquid melatonin, there's some other things I use. So every day, I do what I call a foundational protocol. Um, you can find that at stephencabral.com slash shop. You can actually find it at uh, stephencabral.com slash DFP. I believe that's what it is, stephencabral.com slash DFP. That's what I do every day, and then I add the immunity protocol on top of it. So I don't want to worry, nor is it possible for me to know the exact nutrients my body needs every day. So I flood it with a ton of whole food nutrients, brightly colored fruits and vegetables every day. And then I give it not a mega dose of nutritional supplements, but a good foundational dose 
to be able to help my body to rebuild and rejuvenate on a daily basis. So that's what I do. That's the best advice I can give you. Of course, it's not medical advice. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning into the show. I thank you. I appreciate you. All of your subscribes, all your reviews of the show mean the world to me. If you haven't done it yet, if you could, I would appreciate it. And stay tuned tomorrow. I'll be back with a brand new week of the Cabral Concept, starting off with our Mindset and Motivation Monday. Don't miss it. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.